force us to think that way. Give us a chance to live in ease as you are living, so that we can bring out those latent hidden powers which made a Newton give us a Huxley and a Darwin. We are capable of giving such men to the world if forced into a corner to think. We are a peace-loving people. We love humanity. We love the white race, not for social fellowship, but in the common brotherhood that God intended we shall live. What satisfaction can anyone get in being happy and see his brother wallowing in dirt, filth, and disease? How can men feel happy living in luxuries when others are living in disease? And then when someone tries to help the other out of the disease, the subtle culprit talks about disloyalty. My greatest desire is to see all humanity happy, whether white, yellow, or black, because I know God made this wonderful world for all mankind. The black men of Carthage, the black men of Ethiopia, the black men of Egypt, of Timbuktu and Alexandria gave the light of civilization to the world. Ethiopia shall stretch forth our hands unto God, and princes shall come out of Egypt. Any leadership that teaches you to depend upon another race is a leadership that will enslave you. The race that leads another is always a race of masters, and the race that is led will always remain a race of slaves. They have given leadership to our foreparents, and that leadership made them slaves. We have decided to find the leadership of our own to make ourselves free men. The great scholars, after passing through our schools, their colleges, their universities, have thrown away the blessed record. Babylon did it, Assyria did it, France under Napoleon did it, Germany under Prince von Bismarck did it, Great Britain under William Pitt Earl of Chatham did it, America under George Washington did it, Africa with 400 million black people can do it. If you cannot do it, if you are not prepared to do it, then you will die. You race of cowards, you race of imbeciles, you race of good for nothings. If you cannot do what other men have done, what other races have done, what other nations have done, then you had better die. Can we do it? We can do it. We shall do it. We have prayed to God for the vision and for leadership, and he himself is now our leader, and he has given us a universal vision, a vision that will not limit our possibilities to America, a vision that will not limit our possibilities to the West Indies, but a vision that says there must be a free and redeemed Africa. If we must solve this American problem, if we must solve the West Indian problem, we shall solve it only for the glory of a great empire. We shall solve it only for the glory of a great dominion, a great republic upon which the sun will never set. Whatsoever man has done, man must do. And methinks looking into your eyes, I see great warriors rising up in the cause of African freedom. Methinks I see in the eyes of some of you men, a Brutus, reading in his tent at Philippi, a Richard Coeur de Leon bearing down on the galleons of Spain, and Napoleon storming the bridge of Lodi. Ye men looking into your eyes, methinks I see a crown prince storming the forts of Verdun. Ye more a Marshal Joffrey marching before the French artillery to win at the Marne, everlasting glory for France. And in the eyes of some of you women, I see a Florence Nightingale rising up to do service, not in the Crimean battlefields, but the battlefields of Africa, leading the hundreds and thousands of Black Cross nurses, following the millions of African legions who shall march out to do battle for the everlasting glory of Africa. I see a Joan of Arc, not the white woman of France, but a black woman of Africa, snatch up the flag of the red, the black and the green, and say to 400 black men, follow me. Shall we make it? By the Almighty and the eternal heavens, we have pledged to make it. Give us a standard bearer of Christ, let him lead, and we will follow. Christ the crucified, Christ the despised, we appeal to you from the great memories of the past. We appeal to you for help, for succor, and for leadership. When you endeavor to carry your burden up the heights of Calvary, when white men scorned you, when white men spurned you, when white men spat upon you, when white men pierced your side out of which blood and water gushed forth, it was a black man in the name of Simon the Syrian who took the cross and bore it on the heights of Calvary. So now, when we are climbing our Calvary, the burden being heavy, we ask that you help us on up the journey up the heights. Surely we shall not turn back. The cause is grand. The cause is glorious. Ceylon, Ceylon, O mighty ship of state, Ceylon, we shall not stop now. We shall sail on until the red, the black, and the green is perched upon the hilltops of Africa. Classes, nations, and races which have been quite quiet for over four centuries, and who has been the hewer of wood and drawers of water for other men, who has merely borne abuse, insult, and humiliation for many generations, whose patience, docility, and forbearance can only be compared to the prophet Job, has likewise lifted his bowed head and raised it up to God's skies and cried out, I am a man, and demand a man's chance and a man's treatment in the world. Black people had always been oppressed because of our race. We should therefore strive to put our own racial self-interest first in everything we do. We should support our own businessmen, professionals, writers, athletes, and so on, provided that these persons also have their people's interest at heart. Black people should see beauty in their own kind and not try to bleach their skins or otherwise look like what we're not. In the days of slavery, miscegenation or race mixture had occurred because the African woman had no protection from the slave master. So there is now no need for black people to themselves freely continue a practice that smacks so much of slavery. Our critics say that the race problem will be solved through higher education, through better education, that black and white will come together, that day will never come until Africa is redeemed.
If those who like W.E.B. Du Bois believe that the race problem can be solved in America through higher education, they will walk between now and eternity and never see the problem solved. God made man lord of his creation, gave him ownership and possession of the world, and you have been so darned lazy that you have allowed the other fellow to run away with the whole world, and now he's bluffing you and letting you know that the world belongs to him and that you have no part in it. I do not have to apologize to anybody for being black because God Almighty knew what he was doing when he made me black. If black people knew their glorious past, then they would be more inclined to respect themselves. I shall teach a black man to see beauty in himself and be hanged to the man who said shall not be so. You've heard of Johnny Walker. Well, he had his adversities and he's still going strong, but I intend with your assistance and God's grace to continue. And my work has just begun. And when the history of my suffering is complete, then future generations will have in their hands the guide by which they shall know the sins of the 20th century. I know and I know you two believe in time, but we shall wait patiently for 200 years if need be to face our enemies through our posterity. After my enemies are satisfied in life or death, I shall come back to serve even as I've served before. In life I shall be the same, in death I shall be a terror to the foes of African liberty. If death has power, then count on me in death to be the real Marcus Garvey I would like to be. If I may come in an earthquake or a cyclone or plague or pestilence or as God would have me, then be assured that I shall never desert you and make your enemies triumph over you. Will I not go to hell a million times for you? If I die in Atlanta, my work shall not only then begin, but I shall live in the physical or the spiritual to see the day of Africa's glory. When I am dead, wrap the mantle of the red, the black and the green around me, for in the new life I shall rise with God's grace and blessing to lead the millions of the heights of triumph with the colors that you well know. Look for me in the world when or storm. Look for me all around you, for with God's grace I shall come and bring with me countless millions of black slaves who have died in America and the West Indies and the millions in Africa to aid you in the fight for liberty, freedom and life. The civilization today is gone drunk and crazy with its power, and by such it seeks through injustice, fraud, and lies to crush the unfortunate. But if I'm apparently crushed by the system of influence and misdirected power, my car shall rise again to plague the conscience of the corrupt. For this I'm satisfied, and for you I repeat, I'm glad to suffer and even die. Again I say cheer up, for better days are ahead. I shall write the history that will inspire the millions that are coming, and leave the posterity of our enemies to reckon with the hosts for the deeds of their fathers. The black race is one of the branches of the human race. As a section of humanity, he occupies a position in a world at the present time most unfavorable and most uncomfortable. The black people are subjects of ostracism. It is sad that our humanity has shown us no more love, no greater sympathy than we are experiencing. Wheresoever you go throughout the world, the black man is discarded, is ostracized, is relegated to the lowest in things, social, economic, and political. This therefore suggests a problem and one that must be solved. We in this section of the world are not entirely free from this unkind, unsympathetic, and uncharitable behavior of the groups or races around us. But since man has been placed on his own responsibility, whether he be black, white, or yellow, he must act on his own account. We will not unduly whine or complain, but reason among ourselves and see what can be done to remedy this state of affairs. I select this subject so I may be able to reach out and touch your hearts and minds, so that we may with better understanding go forward and fight properly and surely the battle of life. Life is a conflict. You have to fight your way through it, whether you will it or not. Those who are able to fight most stubbornly live, accomplish most, and to them go the laurels, the palms and triumph of our civilization and world. We unfortunately have not been trained nor educated to the truths of life, paradoxically so. May I say something? To give you a true knowledge of yourself and life, so that the same glory and success attained by other men who understand themselves may be yours. Man in the full knowledge of himself is a superb and supreme creature of creation. When man becomes possessor of the knowledge of himself, he becomes master of his environment, the captain of his own ship, the director of his own destiny, the accomplisher of his own ends. Man should understand himself because man is full of knowledge, and this knowledge is a gift of nature. When Mother Nature created man, she deprived him of nothing. He was given the faculty of understanding all things around him. And this faculty for understanding has not been taken away from man. None of his senses have been taken away from him. So there is no excuse for the black man in lacking the knowledge that man has used to beautify the world and produce all that he needs for his happiness and civilization. Look the world over and whatever you see in it that is pleasing to man, contributing to man's comfort, to his needs and to his satisfaction, it is but the work of man. Man blessed with the knowledge of himself and the understanding of all things around them. If you are to live with the knowledge of yourself and with the greater knowledge of nature, you must know what is good and what is not. You must know what is finite. You must know that which is material, physical, or otherwise is at your disposal to create or otherwise use. Yet what have we done in years gone by? 
There are very few things that we can place our accomplishment for the past years at the services of the white race, the bishops of the counties and shires of England will be compelled to discourse upon the grand achievements of the Anglo-Saxon. They will tell you of the flight of the mighty aeroplane R-101 to India, which, although unsuccessful, was a new conquest of the white man in engineering. They will tell you of the conquest in art, industry, in literature. New books have been written, new editions have been made to literature by the Englishman. In the great cathedral of Notre Dame in France, the bishop lecturing to Frenchmen will tell them of the wonderful achievements of the Frenchman. They will tell you that they have crossed the channel with greater speed than they did previously. They will tell you that they have flown from France to England in shorter time than ever before. If we leave the European countries and go to America, whether it be in the Holy Cross Cathedral in Washington or any of the great cathedrals of New York, the bishops are telling of the wonderful works the American geniuses have accomplished. If we leave America and go over to the east, to Japan, they will be telling their fellow citizens of Japan of the wonderful accomplishments of the Japanese people, proving that man is moving onward as time moves on. But you, what can I tell you? I can only point you to yourselves as disorganized. You have shown malice, prejudice, and hate to each other, and the result is that while other races have made progress, while India has made progress towards nationalism, while Ireland has made progress towards republicanism, while the whole world has made progress in man's accomplishments, you still stand fighting yourselves, dishonoring yourselves, showing no disposition towards a higher life so that you will be abundantly best. I do hope that you will so reflect and think that you were created for some purpose other than exhibiting malice towards your neighbor or fellow men of your own race. What a pity it is that we cannot stand united without a written law, as other races do. There is no written law compelling the members of other races to stand together. They are brought together by the gentle touch of nature. The unwritten law of nature caused them to stand together on all occasions. So whether you find them in the field, industrial or political, that one touch of gentle nature causes them to stand together if need be, die together. But with the black race, you can preach from pulpits, you lecture from the platforms, from the byways and the hedges, the spirit of cooperation, but he will not cooperate. You talk to him gently, you talk to him roughly, and still he will not cooperate. The result is that he falls prey to those who are united, without a written law, but by the touch of nature, those who possess an understanding of themselves and walk through the world making you their serfs and slaves. You must acquire an understanding of yourselves. Look around you, see the smiling pictures of nature, the beautiful hedges, the wonderful mountains, the wonderful vegetation all around, the wonderful climate, the beautiful sunset, the salubrious breezes, probably not to be duplicated in any part of the world. But because of your disposition to each other, you live in suffering, in want, in penury and in debt. You lack the gentle touch of nature, love for each other, you hate yourselves. We in this part of the world constitute one millionth part of four hundred million, and there are not ten of us united in the real spirit of racial love. As I have said before, a congregation of white men gathered together as you are, if you were to take a true analysis of their souls, you would find that the heart of every man present beats in unison, carrying out a certain object for the protection of himself and his posterity. But with you it is merely different. That is your disposition. Where are we going to end? I cannot tell. It seems peculiar that we have sprung from the same mold and yet be so different. Our lack of success is traceable to our bad conduct. At the present time, there is great agitation in the country about aliens coming here and monopolizing our trade. How can we blame them when they form such a small part of our population and cannot control themselves? If there is any blame, it is yours because of the lack of cooperation among you. For they could have achieved no success if we didn't want them to. The success we should have, we deny ourselves and give it to them because we hate ourselves. Black men, black women, what is wrong with you? Why have you no affection for yourselves? But I hope to see you living among yourselves as the people I have spoken of, living in charity, love, in sympathy with each other. It can be done. I wonder if you will adapt that course. Isn't it easier to enjoy prosperity than to live in ignorance and darkness? Why select the worst out of nature? Nature never gave pain, suffering, and death to the world. It was man himself who selected death, pain, and sorrow. I wonder if I cannot inspire you to select between good and evil, the enjoyment of which nature is willing to yield. Let me impress upon you once again that whatsoever your hardships may be, whatsoever your difficulties in life, they are all your own selection. And so, if you encourage them, if you husband them and take them to your bosom, they will abide with you. Nature will not take them from you as Mother Nature did not give them to you. She is not.